Hello and welcome. My name is Darren Forwell. I'm the product evangelist for IP Fabric. As is customary in January, we've been reflecting on the last year and its legacy, both for IP Fabric and for the industry as a whole. And of course, inevitably, thoughts turn to the year ahead and the changes that we might see, both as a result of the last extraordinary year and through normal technological progress. I'm lucky enough to be joined by Pavel Bikov, IP Fabric CEO and longtime network engineer, architect and general geek. I think it's fair to say, Pavel, is that okay? Uh, Absolutely. To chat through some of those thoughts. Welcome. My pleasure, Dan. Now, I think we were all really glad to see the back of 2020, but do you think that there are any real lasting impacts that will shape the direction of networking over the coming years? <laughs> Well, the year is just a number. I did get a feeling throughout the year that home imprisonment is a real <laughs> form of punishment. That's true. Uh, and uh, in many cases, uh, we were and still are forced to experiencing it, um, which is very hard for humans as social beings. Uh, we've got a crash course in remote working. Uh, the internet exchanges were uh, breaking uh, record after record and VPN concentrators were getting a uh, constant stress <laughs> test. Uh, luckily, we, we were at the point where remote working tools were ready and the networks were ready to support them as well. Um, however, we've seen that some of the things just don't work remotely and remote office at the beach is a romantic <laughs> dream, which in the end, results in people not, not enjoying either the beach because they have to work or work because they cannot concentrate or they cannot par participate yeah. uh, in a workplace community where brainstorming, ping-ponging ideas have very real value. That's true. Uh, just like kitchen room chit-chatter. And I, I, I think from the trends point of view, we'll see... Uh, wave of uh, VR um, renaissance uh, because the only way that we can be fully remote and productive is in a matrix type virtual environment, which is sad in, in, uh, <laughs> from some point of view. So I guess with all, all that immersion, um, the data that's gonna have to be thrown to and fro to support that kind of VR, um, availability of the network becomes even more important than ever. Um, so how do we make changes to the way we build and operate them in order to ease the pressure on those poor network managers? Yeah, I feel for all network managers because they're stuck between a, a rock and a hard place, frankly. On one hand, their top priorities are to get rid of technical debt and reduce operational costs. On the other hand, they are plagued uh, with uh, skill so shortages and constantly increasing demands uh, placed on the network infrastructure. And this is also why they're so interested in network automation. Yeah. And I think many of the issues seem intractable because there is no consistency in underlying data, underlying to truth of uh, uh, the network. There is a document here, a note there, an entry over at that other repository. But when they look at every one of these data points and every one of these sources, they'll realize that every single one of them is actually different. And then the actual truth is different yet. Yeah. And our platform lets them to have this actual network truth right away and also serves as a solid foundation for their network automation efforts. Yeah, and of course we've seen network automation really land as a, as a mainstream approach to developing and deploying networks. How do you see that path to substantial automation continue to play out? Right, so network automation is uh, no longer optional uh, and it must be taken seriously at every organization managing a uh, large infrastructure. The current demands on the ratio of managed network devices per engineer is simply beyond what humans can handle without network automation. So either you, you are assuming or you're doing network automation. And we've seen a lot of day zero automation helping with deploying infrastructure. Mm. 
but we also need to think about what happens the following day, you know, after the changes have taken place and the next day after that. Whatever you create, you also have to maintain, which is very taxing and will overload manual capabilities at one point or another. And there will no longer be a choice and there will have to be a budget dedicated to network automation. There's always speculation about the future of networks, that SD-WAN will kill off private networks or that 5G will kill off Wi-Fi, et cetera, et cetera. Have you got any thoughts on the big mega trends that will really impact us over the coming years? Right, as in industry, we're quite conservative, not because we don't want to evolve, but because we know that whatever we do, whatever we invest in, will have to be supported a decade, two decades later. And that's why we must evaluate technology and, and practical implications in depth before deploying it. Wi-Fi has been around since around the times when cell phones were, went mainstream. And just because we are more efficient in spectrum utilization doesn't mean that it's going to be practical to have all of the enterprise use cases on 5G, from security to control. And 5G may kill guest Wi-Fi, but business requirements from wireless in many cases, from campus to automated warehouse floors, just can be practically implemented unless enterprise controls the underlying 5G networks, including say, setting up the base stations. From this point of view, SD1 came out as one of the winners of SDN waves because it put immense pressure on MPLS VPN services and made it simpler and cheaper to deploy and operate WAN from management point of view. When we went over the total cost of SD1 with one of the service providers, we've seen that the cost for SD1 service was actually higher than for MPLS VPN service. However, the price is paid in large part to the SD1 vendor and customers are happy because TC, from the TCO perspective, it becomes cheaper than traditional approach. SD1 is a good example of productization of technology, mm -hmm. which, is, which has historically generated very large operational strain on the uh, network practitioners. This productization is the mega trend that I'm seeing, where people want things to just work in the age of short attention span, which opens up a lot of opportunities for bundling of technologies together in a product. On the other hand, we are seeing that it's imperative for businesses to remain in control of their critical infrastructure. The infrastructure that powers core part of their business. The network powering the production line will never be outsourced. And this is where I see intent-based networking flourishing, where it's imperative to handle the complexity and not hide it in form of the product. So do you see AI as a potential disruptor in networking? And maybe ML, where do you feel that these might have a big impact? Right, so with uh, machine learning, you need a solid and consistent set of training data. We've seen huge advancements in uh, natural language processing. Uh, you know, who, who types messages on their phone still? And if you do, try pressing the microphone button on the phone's <laughs> keyboard instead. You'd be amazed at the precision of that. Thing. Maybe I need to do that. <laughs> so there was huge progress in image recognition, but look at IBM's Watson. It's still struggling to become a good doctor because there is empathy involved, which is extremely hard to label in the data set. And in networking, there are myriads of customizations and unique combinations of uh, implementation. And from what I've seen, applying machine learning to networks directly yields actually progressively worse results because once you eliminate all of the unique cases as noise, you're essentially left with nothing. I feel the biggest impact from the sh in the short term will be where ML can be applied for uh, NLP, such as crawling of knowledge base repositories, wikis, documentation, release notes, support cases, and providing answers uh, faster and more accurately than a search engine would. And in the medium term, I hope to see uh, natural language uh, uh, processing applied to uh, network policy definition, where I can ask the network directly, 
is this service redundant? And after waiting for a couple of seconds, the AI can answer yes or no and, and actually tell me why or why not. Do you see careers in networking shifting at all? How will network engineers, operations managers, etc., need to adapt? Or how will their roles and skill sets potentially be different than they are now? So I, I don't see engineering as a profession to be under threat. The skill gap is as high as it has ever been, and the skills are in extremely high demand. Where I see the biggest shift is that it is no longer feasible to be a CLI typist type of practitioner. If your only skill set is to type in commands, this is simply no longer sufficient. You need solid understanding of the OSI model and the relationships. You should also think about what's the purpose of the network in your business and how the network supports this value creation. It doesn't have to be in such abstract terms, but it's important to look around and understand how the networks drive the digital transformation instead of learning the syntax of a particular CLI. Yeah, that's a, that's a really important point, isn't it? Is understand the impact of the operation of the network on the business as a whole, how services delivered, availability of those services and so on. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you on that one. Listen, thank you, Pavel. I really appreciate you taking the time to give us your thoughts on those topics today and look forward to finding out just how things develop and uh, how close to the mark you really are. Thank you very much. Thank you, Darren. Always a pleasure.